Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Emil. Thank you, both of you, for organizing this, for everyone who's spoken today, for the amazing performance last night. This is just a very exciting week here at the University of Rochester, and it is a pleasure and a privilege to be a part of it. So we have heard so far about Salome in biblical times, in the full sweep of Western art, in English and French literature. And I'm going to be talking about Salome at the theater, Oscar Wilde in Paris and London. The story of Salome at the theater is a story of celebrity, censorship, sex, scandal, and many other things as well. Oscar Wilde wrote the play in French in 1891. He hoped to premiere it in London with the great actress Sarah Bernhardt in the title role in 1892. But the Lord Chamberlain's office prohibited its production and prevented the British opening night. Wilde published the play in French in 1893, and it came out in an English translation with Aubrey Beardsley's controversial black and white illustrations in 1894. Here is the title page of the first French edition, with a somewhat sinister mermaid and the slogan, this fish is not like the others, in Latin around the edge. <laughs> a warning label that the publisher added to the works of all his decadent authors. I'm not sure, actually, whether he meant to warn or entice one way or the other. And here, you can see the frontispiece in the title page of the first English translation with Aubrey Beardsley's famous or infamous illustrations, depending on your point of view. And here, two images that may have more relevance for us, the presentation of Yochanan's dead head at the end of that long black arm, which is the Beardsley equivalent of the poster image that you've been seeing from Russell's graphic novel. And then on the right, the climax, or the kiss. This is the simplified book version of the more complex studio magazine original that you saw in Grace's talk this morning, the image that prompted Wilde to send Beardsley a dedicated copy of the unillustrated French version with the note to Beardsley, the only one who can see the Dance of the Seven Veils. So Wilde was at the top of his career when his play appeared in print. Lady Windermere's fan had just opened for a triumphant run at the St. James Theatre when the Salome French original came out, and a woman of no importance was running at the Theatre Royal in Haymarket when the Salome English version appeared. He lost his literary position and his social standing when his lover Alfred Douglas's father, the Marquess of Queensberry, accused him of being, quote, opposing sodomite, a man who had sex with men. When Wilde sued Queensberry for criminal libel, Queensberry's defense included the presence of homoerotic passages in Wilde's picture of Dorian Gray, the contents of Wilde's private correspondence with Douglas, and the testimony of a number of working class men who had also slept with Wilde while the Douglas relationship was going on. When Wilde withdrew his libel suit for fear of losing, because you cannot libel by telling the truth, Queensberry's lawyers forwarded their evidence to the offices of the British Crown. The British government charged, tried, and eventually convicted Wilde on seven counts of what they called committing acts of gross indecency with another male person in 1895. Friends stopped talking to him. Directors took his name off their posters and programs. The Haymarket Theatre closed his new play, An Ideal Husband, in the middle of its run. The St. James Theatre did the same with the importance of being earnest. Wilde was doing hard time in Reading Jail when the independent French director, Aurélien lunier Poe staged the world premiere of Wilde's Salome in Paris as a gesture of artistic solidarity with a fellow iconoclast in 1896. Here is the first page of the program for the Théâtre de l'Oeuvre, where the play appeared in a double bill with Romain Coulus Raphael, the story of what happens when a married woman who already has one lover falls in love with a younger man and takes on another. The circular design that you see in the upper left-hand corner of the program is the theater's monogram, designed by Pierre Bonnard to make a deliberate anarchist connection between the theater's artistic work and the muscular male laborer's manual work. Toulouse-Lautrec contributed a lithograph of Oscar Wilde standing in front of the British Houses of Parliament, which you see here. 
an ironic image, given that Wilde was actually in a British prison when his play premiered. So whether French and British reporters, literary critics, and theater reviewers were covering the canceled British production, the published French play, or the Paris world premiere, they consistently linked their coverage to the question of how to understand the relationship between France and England. And for the rest of my paper today, I'd like to show you how the continuing controversies over the play, its publication, and its performance also became controversies over the literary, political, and sexual culture of these two competing countries. Let's start with the projected London premiere starring Sarah Bernhardt. Bernhardt was already an international superstar when Wilde was writing his French play. Although she always acted in French, audiences responded to her gestures as well as her words. She established a successful career not only in France, but also in a long list of other countries, including England, the United States, and Canada. London audiences especially loved her for her performances in tragic roles such as Jean Racine's Phèdre, Mayak and Alevi's Gilbert in Fru Fru, Alexandre Dumas' fils Marguerite Gautier in La Dame aux Camélia, and Victorien Sardou's exotic Russian princess Fedora, Byzantine empress Theodora, and eventual operatic heroine La Tosca. And here she is starring as Victorien Sardou's Cleopatra in 1891, just one year before she agreed to star in Wild Salome. French poet Pierre Louis, who attended the rehearsals in London, remembered her performance this way. What a marvelous Salome Madame Bernhardt was. How the melodious inflections of her stature and her voice adjusted to the cruel and amorous phantom that Monsieur Wilde had evoked in its mysterious attractiveness. How well she performed Wilde's rich, insinuating, singing prose. The British Lord Chamberlain's decision to prohibit the Wilde Bernhardt production made front page headlines in Paris right away. And here is the first page of the Daily Gaulois, where you see the title of the first French article about the issue, about halfway down in the second column from the right. The Salome of Oscar Wilde, conversation with the author from our ordinary correspondent, Maurice Sisley. Censor Edward Piggott gave no specific reason for his decision, except to cite an 18th century law that prohibited the production of biblical subjects upon the British stage because it was seen as a lower class location that was not appropriate for high literature or high art. Many British reporters and reviewers seem to have accepted this reasoning at face value, but most French reporters and reviewers, by contrast, immediately started speculating that Piggott's decision really had something to do with the play's potent mixture of sex and death, especially the murderous sexuality of Salome herself, which we've heard a lot about today already. And as it happens, they were absolutely right. We know from a letter that Piggott wrote his friend Spencer Ponsonby separately. He said, I must send you for your private edification and amusement this manuscript of a one-act piece written by Oscar Wilde. It is a miracle of impudence. Salome's love turns to fury because John will not let her kiss him in the mouth. And in the last scene, where she brings in his head, if you please, on a charger, she does kiss him out in the mouth in a paroxysm of sexual despair. The piece is written in French, half biblical, half pornographic. Imagine the average British public's reception of it. Wilde gave two public interviews about the censor's decision. And this is where questions of sexuality start to tangle up with questions of nationality. If the censure refuses Salome, Wilde told the Pall Mall budget while the decision was still under review, I shall leave England and settle in France where I will take out letters of naturalization. I will not consent to call myself a citizen of a country that shows such narrow-mindedness in its artistic judgments. My decision is firm, he repeated to Maurice Sisley in the article that you see on the screen here. Because it is impossible to perform a work of art in England, I am going to enter a new country that I have loved for a long time. There is only one Paris, you see, and Paris is in France. It is the city of artists. I would even say that it is the artistic city. When Sisley asked Wilde whether he had a bad opinion of his fellow countrymen, Wilde responded by denying his affiliation with the English altogether. Oh, 
They have practical qualities. I do not deny it, he said. But in my situation as an artist, those are not the qualities that I admire most. Furthermore, even at this very moment that I am speaking to you, I am not English. I am still Irish, which is not at all the same thing. <laughs> and he said that some of his best friends were English, but he did not like the English as a race. The scandal around Salome's censorship did not disappear with the prohibition of the play. When Wilde published the play in book form, reviewers in France and England almost always opened their articles by recalling the original incident, reviewing the reasoning behind the censorship decision, and making some new comparative comment on French and British culture. Here you see the faded lavender cover of that original French edition with Salome's name almost rubbed out, but originally across the front in gilt lettering. Wilde chose the color combination himself. He called it Tyrian purple and fading silver. And he referred it to it often when he sent dedicated copies of the book to his friends. Here, for example, is his particularly evocative exchange with George Bernard Shaw, one of the contemporary leaders in the fight against British stage censorship. My dear Shaw, Wilde wrote him in February 1893, you have written well and wisely and with sound wit on the ridiculous institution of a stage censorship. England is the land of intellectual fogs, but you have done much to clear the air. We are both Gaelic, and I like to think that we are friends. For these and many other reasons, Salome presents herself to you in purple raiment. <laughs> Notice how Wilde separates himself from the English again by stressing that he and Shaw are both Gaelic, Irish. And notice also how he refers to the book version of the play in the feminine person as if Salome the book and Salome the character in the book were one and the same. When he went back to tell Wilde that the book had not yet arrived, he expanded on the identification between the play and its title character by describing Salome in vivid terms as a victim of state violence, perhaps state sexual violence. Salome is still wandering in her purple raiment in search of me, he told Wilde, and I expect her to arrive a perfect outcast, branded with inky stamps, bruised by flinging from hard hands into red prison vans, stuffed and contaminated. The public debate about the play that appeared in the French and British press continued the censorship controversy by consistently reminding readers that the new book was the print version of a play that had been refused permission to perform. So, for example, on the one hand, the anonymous reviewer for the London Times introduced the piece as, quote, the play written for Sarah Bernhardt, which the Lord Chamberlain declined to license for performance in this country, and denounced it in categorical terms as an arrangement in blood and ferocity, morbid, bizarre, repulsive, and very offensive in its adaptation of scriptural phraseology to situations the reverse of sacred. It is not ill-suited to some of the less attractive phases of Madame Bernhardt's dramatic genius, the reviewer continued, and it is vigorously written in some parts, but we must say that the opening scene reads to us very like a page from one of Ollendorf's exercises. With this dismissive final phrase, the critic relegated the play's sophisticated series of identifications between the Silver Moon and Salome to the status of so many children's exercises in elementary French grammar. Among the play's French defenders, by contrast, they mentioned the censorship decision not to approve it, but to contest it. And so, for example, you have Henri de Renier blaming the censorship on what he called an excess of British modesty, pudeur, and suggesting the superiority of France over England by reminding the readers of the événement politique et littéraire that Monsieur Wilde had written the play in French during one of his stays in Paris, and it is in Paris that he recently published it. Characterizing the play in positive terms as a work of extreme charm, he praised it for an... <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> his words, not mine, <laughs> and these are more of his words, an abundant and color-filled lyricism, a manner of bidding highly on hyperbole and insisting on it with the caress of successive images, little phrases that have the soft rhythm of a beating fan, 
a very unexpected inventiveness in the details, and a style, perhaps more fragrance than figure, that evaporates above the idea like the spirals of smoke mounting from an incense burner. Among the play's English defenders, Alfred Douglas put it this way in an especially long, detailed, and vigorous article for the Oxford undergraduate magazine, The Spirit Lamp. I suppose the play is unhealthy, morbid, unwholesome, and un-English, he wrote. Ça va sans dire. That goes without saying. It is certainly un-English because it is written in French. And therefore, <laughs> unwholesome to the average Englishman who can't digest French. It is probably morbid and unhealthy, for there is no representation of quiet domestic life. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody slaps anybody else on the back. There is not a single reference to roast beef from one end of the dialogue to the other. And although it is true that there is a reference to Christianity, there are no muscular Christians. Anyone, therefore, who suffers from that most appalling and widespread of diseases which takes the form of a morbid desire for health had better avoid and flee from Salome. But the less violently and aggressively healthy, those who are healthy to live and do not live to be healthy, will find in Mr. Oscar Wilde's tragedy the beauty of a perfect work of art, a joy forever, ambrosia to feed their souls with the honey of sweet, bitter thoughts. So note how Douglas combines his critique of British censorship with a comprehensive critique of British culture that includes language, cuisine, family life, norms of masculinity, and forms of Christianity, all at the same time. Of course, Wilde's and Douglas' own refusal to stick to English, live a quiet domestic life, demonstrate a hearty form of backslapping masculine behavior, or bow to the tenets of the muscular Christian religion, would ultimately blow up into a Victorian sexual scandal that would make the initial censorship scandal over Salome seem small. From the start of Wilde's suit against the Marquess of Queensbury for criminal libel, to the conduct of not one but two British state suits against Wilde for committing acts of gross indecency with another male person on seven separate occasions, to Wilde's final conviction and his sentencing to two years in prison at hard labor, Wilde's unorthodox life and challenging literary work made headlines on the front pages of the British and the French press for a period of roughly two months, from the 3rd of April, 1895, to the 25th of May, and then echoes on and on after that. So here are two images from the Illustrated Police News, which covered the trial in obsessive illustrated detail. But regular print dailies also found ways to evoke the same sense of drama with words and headlines alone. Oscar and Marquis, strange libel case opened, a remarkable letter to Lord Alfred Douglas. The esthete gives characteristically cynical evidence, replete with pointed epigram and startling paradox, and discusses his ideas of art. Mr. Carson, Queen's Counsel, opposes the play of Oscarism with direct suggestions of immorality. These were some of the British headlines. Headlines in France were shorter, but they ranged from relatively discreet references, such as Oscar Wilde's lawsuit, all the way up to more salacious titles, such as The Wilde Affair, The London Scandals, or even Prudish Albion! Exclamation point. As this last headline suggests, French journalists took advantage of the British trial to criticize English sexual behavior, a task that they accepted with special relish since British cultural commentators had so often denounced the French for indulging in a range of illicit sexual behaviors that included serial adultery, prostitution, homosexuality, and lesbian love. Our neighbors to the West must be awfully unhappy nowadays, wrote Jacques Sincere in the conservative Daily Figaro, since they've been in the habit of calling Paris Babylon, Sodom, Gomorrah, Lesbos, and God knows what else. <laughs> Even though writers such as Sincere and others criticize British hypocrisy, however, they still found ways to make it clear that they had little sympathy for Wilde himself. The vast majority of both the British and the French articles stressed their support for various forms of heterosexual desire and condemned Wilde's homosexual behavior out of hand. 
when symbolist poet Stuart Merrill tried to begin an international campaign to petition Queen Victoria for Wilde's release from prison on humanitarian grounds, most of the prominent writers that he invited to sign either ignored his letter or rejected it outright. So this is the context in which Antoine Lunierpeau and his colleagues decided to premiere Salome in Paris. Lunierpeau was an avant-garde theater director whose independent Théâtre de l'Oeuvre had close literary ties with the French symbolist movement and close political sympathies with the French anarchist movement. His company was especially well known for its Paris premieres of controversial new plays by challenging foreign authors, such as the Norwegian Henrik Ibsen, the Swedish August Strindberg, and the Belgian Maurice Maeterlinck. And here is Henri Vuillard's 1891 image of Lunier Poe, sorry, Edouard Vuillard, which you can actually visit right across town at the Memorial Art Gallery. We have it in our museum, and it is an amazing little piece of art. And here is the list of plays that Lunier Poe originally had in mind for his theater's third season in 1895-1896. Note that Wild Salome is not there yet. That is a measure of how suddenly the production came together for just one night in response to current events after the theatrical season had already started. Lunier Poe put it this way in his memoirs. Wilde's fall was atrocious. The scandal was such that English society hid its eyes and stopped its ears after his conviction. But in Paris, Wilde remained esteemed because no one had decided to take the action of grouping those who loved the artist into a movement of pity I bypassed all preliminary authorization and produced Salome on the 11th of February, 1896, even though we also were menaced with lawsuits, commercial this time, and on the soil of France. Although this is a somewhat self-promoting memory, Stuart Merrill's petition campaign and a number of other French literary figures' editorials in favor of Wilde preceded Lunier Poe's premiere by more than six months. And some of Wilde's closest French and British friends persistently kept in touch with him while he was in jail. It is nevertheless certainly true, both that Lunier Poe took a commercial risk in premiering the play and that the press responded to it as a new statement of sympathy for Wilde and his work. Sarah Bernhardt was unavailable for reasons that remain unclear, but Lunier Poe himself took the part of Herod, and the new Salome was Lina Mant a young actress who was especially good at playing femme fatale. Here is Mant's photo by Nadar, the great photographer of 19th century French arts and letters, who is also well known for having lent his studio to the first official exhibit of French Impressionist painting. One of Mant's stage biographers stressed her dangerous and perhaps somewhat androgynous allure not so well captured in this photo when he described her this way, long, as long as a day without bread, generally dressed all in black like one of Monsieur Marlborough's pages, she willingly gives the effect of a pretty stick of sealing wax for sealing death announcements. For her performance as Salome, she apparently appeared instead in red. One perform reviewer described her performance in what he called, quote, a red tunic that makes the softness and the suppleness of her body stand out. And she received rave reviews from across the aesthetic and political spectrum of the Paris press, whether or not reviewers appreciated the play itself. Jean de Tinon, who started his review for the symbolist monthly Mercure de France by proclaiming that it is not possible to praise Monsieur Lunier Pau enough for having given us this representation of Wilde's French drama, reported, for example, I do not know a single tragedian, not even Sarah Bernhardt, whom I admire, who has ever made me feel the thrill of feverish sensation that Mademoiselle Lina Mant gave me in Salome. That voice and that beauty brought me into one of the most frenetic states of emotion that I have ever known. And he expands upon it in two more paragraphs, which we don't have time for. Even Francis Sarcet, the conservative critic for the Daily Temps, who was well known for shooting down every modern play that came across the Paris stage, he hated them all. He complained that, quote, the boredom that arises out of Salome is insupportable. <laughs> but he still praised Mant for her troubling beauty in the title role. French theater reviewers connected Salome the play's Paris premiere 
to the circumstances of Wilde's recent London trial and ongoing English imprisonment in the same way that book reviewers had connected Salome the Book's French edition to the circumstances of Salome the Play's censored London performance. The two big differences between the coverage of Wilde's work in 1896, after the trial, and the earlier coverage of it in 1893, after the censorship, are first, the play received much more attention than the book. And second, the French sympathy for Wilde was divided after his trial in a way that it had not been as a result of his censorship alone. On the one hand, for example, you have the case of Henry Bauer, who had consistently supported Wilde and his work before, during, and after his trial with articles for the Echo de Paris that condemned the censorship of Salome on the London stage, wrote in Wilde's defense during his trial, criticized Wilde's treatment in prison, and urged his fellow writers to support Stuart Merrill's petition to Queen Victoria for his release. Bauer had worked with the Théâtre de l'Oeuvre ever since its foundation. It may have been Bauer himself who actually convinced Lunier Poe to stage Salome's Paris premiere, although Lunier Poe does not say so. When Bauer reviewed the production, he devoted the first line to the news that Salome triumphed at the Théâtre de l'Oeuvre, and the first paragraph to the story. Salome, he explained, is the one-act play in French prose by the English poet Oscar Wilde, who has been condemned to two years of forced labor by a judgment that outrages common sense and humanity. The readers who honor me with a faithful attention will understand my joy at this evening. I am truly happy and a bit proud of the event. Thus, the work which, like all those of the author, has been struck from the posters and prohibited from the stages of England, has received an asylum to the glory of Paris. On the other end, at the opposite side, you have the case of Camille Le Sen, who devoted the first paragraph of his review in Le Siècle to the claim that, quote, the idea of representing Salome, the one-act play in French prose by Monsieur Oscar Wilde, on a Parisian stage, so soon after a trial that was as repugnant as it was resounding, will doubtless seem fairly debatable. The English theaters have struck the entire body of work by the equivocal pope of the aesthetes out of their repertoire, and I do not think that any of our official enterprises would dream of selling this mass of leftovers. Discussing the course of the performance itself, he reported, the curtain falls, the aesthetes roar, the public remains cold. So where does this leave us with the story of Oscar Wilde in Paris and London? Here is Toulouse-Lautrec's watercolor again, this time in its original color, the French painting of the Irish esthete against a British backdrop. Wilde got out of jail on the 19th of May, 1897. He left England for France and invited Antoine Lunier Poe to a meeting just five days later with a letter that highlighted their common work on the play whose public fortunes Wilde had tried to follow from his prison cell. The author of Salome, he wrote, begs the Tetrarch of Judea to do him the honor of lunching with him tomorrow morning at noon. Reflecting on that meeting the next day, Wilde wrote his friend Moore Aidy in terms that stressed the contrast between the British condemnation of his life and the French appreciation for his work. What I want Lunier Poe to say, if he writes about our interview, is how grateful I was and am to France for their recognition of me as an artist in the day of my humiliation, and how my better treatment in an English prison was due to the French men of letters. Wilde's expression of gratitude here echoes all the way back to his identification of Paris as the artistic city par excellence in 1892. It also resonates with the work of all those French writers and reviewers who condemned the hypocrisy of British culture during Salome's censorship, the play's appearance in French print, Wilde's London trial, and the play's Paris premiere. At the same time, however, and here I come to my conclusion, I find that the history of Salome and its reception still raises a number of puzzling interpretive problems. In particular, knowing all that I know about the history of both French and British politics and culture in a variety of other 19th and 20th century episodes, I can't help wondering about the truth value of the long series of cross-cultural insults that so many of the French and British writers and reviewers exchanged as they argued over Wilde's Salome story. 
On the one hand, for example, it is true that Salome premiered in Paris and not in London. On the other hand, it is also true that France had its own system of theatrical censorship, a system that Lunier Poe got around, not necessarily because the secular French state was so accepting, but because Lunier Poe presented his plays to private subscription audiences instead of trying to get them on the official programs of state-sponsored public theaters. London would not see a public production of Wild Salome until 1931, but there were private productions as early as 1905 and 1906. The censors allowed Strauss's opera version in 1910, and Maud Allen's freestanding dance version of Marcel Rémy's vision of Salome was a smash hit for 10 years from 1908 to 1918. On the one hand, similarly, it is true that Wilde chose to go to France after he got out of jail in England. And France was unique in Western Europe by virtue of the fact that it had no laws against sodomy in its criminal code, and this made it a potential safe space for men who wanted to have sex with men. On the other hand, it is also true that the French police used other laws to find other ways of making men pay for their same-sex pleasures unless those men were very careful about when, where, and how they came together. Wilde took care to travel to France under the assumed name of Sebastian Melmoth, and not everyone echoed Lunier Poe's warm welcome when he arrived. He never recovered his literary career. So the story of Salome at the theater shows us how an influential group of French and British symbolists, decadents, esthetes, and avant-garde artists glorified French culture condemned British hypocrisy, and reveled in the pleasures of Paris. At the same time, the mixed reactions to Oscar Wilde's life and work in Paris and London alike also show us not only the potential, but also the peril of basing our final understanding of the relative nature of French and British politics, culture, state censorship, religious position, or sexual standard on the basis of this set of cross-cultural comparisons alone. Thank you.